I have received your questions, dear viewers. Allow me to answer your query. How many cloaks do you own? Fewer than the optimal number of cloaks. Which of the four temperaments would you align yourself with? Melancholic, because I'm prone to intellectual fantasy. What advice do you have for other people trying to build a brand on this platform? Don't chase trends. Unionize. Keep your humours in balance so you don't end up making a horrible mistake. Learn basic sound editing. If you have no dignity, just make a response to a popular person who you think is bad and then tag them into it so all their fans watch it and then downvote you because YouTube will consider that engagement and boost you in terms of the algorithm. Abolish capitalism. But, above all, I agree with the premise that an artist creates the taste by which they are to be appreciated. Dump whatever weird stuff you think is cool and you'll find a niche. YouTube is a hell site, so it's always best to enjoy yourself rather than algorithm chase. What is the richest food you have ever had? Either smoked salmon or the beautiful taste of petty vengeance when someone you don't like gets owned on Twitter. That is the good stuff. Hopes for series 12 of Doctor Who. Give me the quality plague episodes I deserve, Chris Chibnall. An episode in ancient Greece. More episodes on other planets with explicitly non-human aliens. More specifically, though, a sequel to Kablam. That episode had some weird politics, especially the ending, and also none of the problems in universe were really solved. The writer might double down, or take the opportunity to re-examine it. Either way, the video essays are going to be amazing. Series 11 was weirdly centrist in a lot of ways. It's like they were trying to counteract the fact that random internet weirdos would be really pissed off at the casting by being as politically bland as possible. Kablam was the most obvious example, but the closest thing it had to anything to say was explicit bigotry is bad. I think Rosa and the Witchfinders would have benefited enormously from being pure historicals. The Witchfinders in particular undercut its own point by having the problem be solved by a literal witch hunt, when it could have been a lot stronger if it were about, like, the witch hunt inspiring a women's riot. That could have gone into some very interesting places and make the fact it was wiped from the history books make a lot more sense. The Demons of the Punjab was the big exception to this, with the deep call-out of the British Empire, which is extremely rare on a British show. Chibnall says he wants to look at climate change, given that it's topical at the moment. And I'm hopeful, given that some of Doctor Who's best episodes have come from examining that theme, the Green death is the most obvious example. In addition, he also wrote 42 back in series 3, and that episode, in addition to being an actual gem, is basically about how fracking is bad, so we could get some really interesting stories out of that. Though, of course, if the weird centrism continues, that might not happen. I want a closer look at the darker aspects of the Doctor's character, not to make her uncheerful, but she is still the Doctor. There was that great moment in the first episode where she tricks Tim Shaw into melting himself with his own weapon, a la the Seventh Doctor. And in Rosa, she gets the bad guy to activate his restraining bolt by throttling her, and she seems to enjoy it. I would like more of those dark moments because 13 needs fleshing out a bit more. Also, in Series 11, it was a bit weird how Graham got the most character focus. In other words, the only white dude in the cast got the most attention from the writers. Suspicious. So I'd like more focus on Ryan and especially Yaz. Again, there were some great missed opportunities in Series 11, so hopefully they can make it up this series. In general, I'm hopeful the returning writers as writers of the most interesting episodes last series and a quick google of newcomers shows promise and i'd love to see what they have to contribute will you ever do a video on miasma or other pre-victorian medicine box friend you know full well that i will but acquiring the resources to make the video i want it to be takes time because capitalism sucks what food is there in the void my favourite is Void smoothies, though there are also many interesting delights that are made from Void substance. Ink chips, singularity balls, galaxy burgers. It's all vegan for some reason, but it's much nicer than earthly vegan food. There's a really nice treat called nebula dust that tastes a bit like a mixture of mango and ginger. 
Interestingly, a lot of it is similar to Earth seafood. Also, a lot of bits like the crust of pizza or those bits of crisps that you can't get out the corners of the packet fall in here. I don't know why void litter is the most annoying thing in the world. People of the physical plane, stop chucking odd socks and pens and things in here. It's unbearable. Any queer or LGBT heroes? First person to come to mind is my boy Magnus Hirchfeld, a gay Jewish socialist born in 1868 Prussia. He was an advocate for LGBT rights. He worked to abolish paragraph 175, which was the law that outlawed homosexuality. He did the first research on gay suicide rates. He campaigned for the legalization of abortion. He consistently maintained that homosexuality and female sexuality was normal and natural. He wrote pacifist pamphlets during the First World War. He coined the word transvestite and later transsexualismus to describe people who today would be described as transgender, making him a pioneer in how we now see transness. His understanding of gender and sexuality was not binary. He came up with 64 identities to cover the full spectrum, but his crowning achievement was the Institute of Sexology, founded in 1919. It was created under the relatively liberal Weimar government. It housed a research library, a large cave of work. It advocated for sex education, contraception, treatment of STIs and women's rights. It treated poorer visitors for free. People from all over Europe came to understand their sexuality. It offered trans people shelter, medical treatment, including what we now call gender recognition surgery, and work, though admittedly mostly of the menial sort. It was a focal point for scientific, political and social reforms. Unfortunately, the Nazi thing happened. In 1933, any of the books that the Institute had that hadn't been smuggled out were burned during a massive crackdown on the rights of LGBT people in general. Hirschfeld fled the country, being an obvious target given both his adequacy and the fact he was gay and Jewish. He spent his final years writing a book called Racismus, in which he argued that the problems in his home country weren't just an aberration, they were the inevitable result of the theories of scientific racism that had been popular for the last century or two. He criticised the way white supremacy was justified and argued for race theory as they knew it to be got rid of due to the way it, it inspired prejudice. He died in 1935. There are probably more radical people I could have brought up. Hirschfeld was far from perfect. He was a eugenicist and could fall into respectability politics on occasion. But Hirschfeld is my queer hero for his lifelong pioneering work, both politically and scientifically, and for the lessons his story tells us. No progress is irreversible. Do not get complacent. And while his legacy and influence was undercut by the Nazis and the dickish decisions of the West German courts, it's important to remember that he helped people in the moment he lived. And that, dear Squidlings, is worthy enough. Thank you for your questions, and I'm genuinely interested. Who are you, historical queer heroes? And tell me in the comments why. Also, abolish time cops.